morning, everyone. How are we doing? Well, let's get all in here together so we can stay warm. It is freezing out. It must have got really cold in here. It must have got really cold in the building because my guitar was like tuned like three steps down. And so that's what happens when the string, when it gets really cold, it changes your tuning. So it's a good indication if I know if Debbie or Jane have been here or not. I got <laughs> Probably working virtual this week. Um, oh yeah, it must have been cold in here. Um, but anyway, um, it's good to see you guys. Sorry I was out last week. Um, we had our little family Christmas. I think with my with my uh, wife's side. So her grandma does theirs on like after the new year. They have all the craziness. But it was good. And um, and my baby is coming very soon. So it's going to be nuts. It's going to be nuts. So uh, due on the 26th of December or of February. That's how little sleep I've been getting the last couple of weeks. Um, Hey, and good morning. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ben Tapper. I'm the worship leader here, and I just wanted to say thank you again, whether you're joining us in person or online. Thanks again for joining us. Make sure that you fill out a connection card. That's the first thing, the most important thing that um, I would say for any new person to do. Fill out a connection card. Let us know you're here. Let us know you're watching from. Um, it's super important so we can stay connected with you. Additionally, make sure you download our Church Center app. You can learn more on the website at vrcc.church. Download the app. It's got tons of awesome resources on it. Um, from giving, volunteering, uh, signing up for groups, being part of groups. Um, there's so many different things that you can do. You can even watch this service online or past services if you've missed any. And also, if you haven't yet, make sure you check in with us. It's the best way for us to know you're not falling through the cracks. So I just want to say thank you again for joining us. Um, thanks and have a great day. Good morning. Holy cow, looks like the cold weather kept a lot of people away. We used to call it, uh, when I was in Bible school, when it was snow on the ground and, and uh, the people that lived in the dorms two blocks away didn't make it because of snow, but those of us who drove from Marysville made it. We called them snow wimps. Snow wimps. And so maybe there's some ice wimps out there, you guys. Hope you're listening. No, just, just kidding, just kidding, obviously. But um, I just wanted to say that uh, during worship, um, I, was, I, I was really, um, when I was here at the altar, I was really contemplating um, my real dedication to the Lord, my real desire. I mean, do I really want to serve Him with all that I am? Is that, is that really the, the desire of, of my heart? And, and sometimes I, I almost feel like I'm, like I'm double-minded. You, you know, like, like there's, this, there's a struggle that goes on between all of us when we become a Christian. Not so much before because we, we don't really understand it. But when we become Christians, we realize that there's a, there's a struggle that goes on between the carnal nature and our and our our uh, um, saved nature, our spiritual nature. I'll just say it that way. And 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 there's this there's this constant battle that that goes on. And we've determined that that we're going to serve Jesus and that we're going to give our all to our to that spiritual nature in in our lives, that redeemed nature. That, that's in in our hearts and our lives and uh, the other day I, I, I read a quote from uh, C.S. Lewis and uh, and he said this he says that 
discernment is not the ability to know the difference between right and wrong. Discernment is the ability to know the difference between right and almost right. And, 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 and that's, that's where we, we struggle. That's where we live. You know, and, and I know that there's so many times in my life that, I, that, that I'll say, oh, I can do that. It's not real bad. But is it really, you know, beneficial, you know, to my life as, as, as a believer? And, and I, I'm, I'm getting, you know, down to the nitty gritty, you know, that's in me sometimes. But it, it comes down to, to sometimes, am I going to watch that? program on TV or am I going to um, read those three or four chapters in my Bible and it's like well I read my Bible yesterday this program's only on today and yeah it, you know there's grace but sometimes you know we, we need to make that distinction and it's like you know who am I serving am I serving my my own needs or am I serving Jesus? And something too is is that that we can we can slide into this church environment, this church you know social structure, and and we can become what I call socialized Christians to where that yeah man I mean I go to church you know I enjoy all the people there you know I don't drink I don't chew and I don't go with the girls that do you know I've cleaned myself up pretty good. Um, you know, so it, what, what, what if I, you know, don't really represent Jesus completely and, and, and wholly, um, you know, and uh, so, so, so anyway, that's, those are the kinds of things that I am so grateful that the Holy Spirit digs down into my heart, so grateful, but on the other hand, nah, I kind of wish you wouldn't, but Boy, I don't want the I don't want the Holy Spirit to leave me alone. I don't want the Holy Spirit to leave me where I am. I want to be a better Christian today than I was yesterday. I've got this little this little quote on on, on the wall in my above my desk at home, and 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 it it says that that the the goal today is to take one step closer to Christ than I did yesterday. One step closer today than I did yesterday. And uh, um, one thing that's pretty encouraging is, is that uh, uh, we take that step, and guess who meets us there? Yeah, the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus meets us there. So anyway, that's my little mini thought for this morning, and, and uh, um, that's just the kind of things that God talks to me you know that God penetrates down into me, that reaches into me when uh, when, I, when I'm on my knees, um, and uh, I'm grateful. F I'm just grateful for it, and I just wanted to share that this morning. So anyway, as far as announcements go, uh, you can see that the uh, only flyer we have in here is about our our prayer meeting, and that'll be uh, tonight at six o'clock. And uh, um, it yeah, it's going to be cold outside. But uh, the roads are clear. There's not, there's not any ice on the roads. Uh, a few places there's a little bit of frost, but for the most part, you know, the roads are all clear. Um, so hopefully you can come out tonight and join us at 6 o'clock. And uh, also that uh, this coming Wednesday is uh, uh, when all of our life groups begin. There's going to be the adult Bible study that uh, Bert is actually uh, leading, and uh, that's going to meet here in the sanctuary. Is that right, Bert? I'll meet here in the sanctuary, and then Wednesday night kids is beginning again, and then the Women's Authentic uh, Winter Bible Study is going to be meeting. You can read about all of that in, in the bulletin. And then also, um, uh, you can still see at the bottom of the bulletin to where that we need uh, a couple of volunteers for the, uh, for the bread ministry. And um, I think that's, oh, we're going to take our offering. I got carried away and forgot about the offering. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and do that. Father, we just thank you for your blessings upon us, and we thank you, God, uh, that uh, um, we have uh, very uh, capable uh, people, Lord Jesus, that um, are on the board, and they determine 
uh, where these finances go, and we just thank you, God. You just can, we pray you continue to bless them and use this money, God, for the furtherance of your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, um, you know, we've, at, uh, um, we've got some extensive resources in the uh, snowboarding and uh, GoPro world. So I, I, I started making contact with some of those uh, resources, and uh, I actually found this video posted of Pastor Steve uh, snowboarding. So if you guys want to show that real quick, please. There he is. There he is. Woohoo! There it is. He didn't even fall down. Didn't even. I saw several of him falling down, but I figured, hey, we'll just show that one instead. So anyway, uh, Pastor Steve is, uh, is, is headed for Utah uh, for a couple of weeks to enjoy some uh, snowboarding bliss, snowboarding heaven, um, whatever. So anyway, come on, Pastor. We, just, we really appreciate you, and <laughs> glad you can take a joke. <laughs> I, I was thinking, oh, maybe you did actually find one of me. But <laughs> <laughs> As Stan was up here um, talking and giving his, his, little, um, his little blurb that he always, you know, the word of encouragement, it's an exhortation, I guess you'd say, scripturally. And I was thinking, yeah, it's kind of like, Guer uh, what's his name, Jimmy Fallon's guy? Uh, Guerno? No. Guillermo, yeah, he's my Guillermo. I'm Jimmy Fallon. He's Guillermo. He comes up and and does his little thing, and then <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, hey, thanks. It I we really are looking forward to uh, getting away for two weeks. Karen and I. Um, her sister came in last night. That's why Karen's not here this morning. She's uh, only has just a little bit of time to connect with her sister, so she came in late last night. And uh, she'll be watching Rita for a couple weeks, and then we'll we'll take off tomorrow morning, and um, unless Alaska cancels our flight, they well they already canceled our flight that was at 6:20, but got us on one at 11:30. Uh, so I'm I'm hoping that's all good. And the, yeah yeah exactly, yeah. Um, such a privilege to be able to uh, share again. Next week, um, uh, Gabe is going to uh, be sharing, and he's he's going to be speaking on uh, on the parable of the uh, the four soils, or the parable of the sower, or the parable of the seed. It's you know called all all those different things, and so um, yeah, uh, I I was thinking, okay, he's going to speak on that parable. Um, and I was speaking about money last week from Philippians and kind of have finished up Philippians. I love going through longer passages of Scripture. And um, so I'll plan to start that again in February. I just don't know exactly what yet. But um, I thought today I'd, I'd like to uh, talk about another parable, a parable dealing with money. You know, Jesus, um, he spent a lot of time talking about money. Kind of depending on how you look at it and how you parse it out, some people say he spoke more about money than any other topic. Um, others others say, well, it was mostly about the kingdom of God, and so you know it depends. I think the kingdom of God is most central, but money is is a huge part of our practical everyday life and a huge part of how we live out the kingdom. And um, so it's it's really. Uh, important for us to to dig into this book and and see what does it say about our practical everyday life in terms of how we how we handle the money that God gives us and um, it's a lifelong endeavor changes as we get older we, we get into different stages of life um, you know Karen and I we, we don't consider ourselves retired, but we're in the 
I, I guess, officially in the retirement age. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's changed the structure of our finances and how things look. And every, every phase is different. And so we need to keep digging. We need to keep asking the question, Lord, what does it look like right now for you to be Lord over this part of my life? Um, and, and so this book has a lot to say to us. Um, but it's important that we know that this book is written for us, but it wasn't written to us. In other words, the writers of the Gospels, they were writing with a very distinct audience in mind as they were writing. Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience. Luke was writing to a Gentile audience, a Greek audience. Um, Mark was the first one to record uh, the words of Jesus in, in one of the Gospels, uh, very much dependent upon his relationship to Peter. So what we understand is that in Mark, we kind of get the voice of Peter. Um, John was writing at the very end and writing to a church that was already established and had gone through some real struggles um, and gone through some real persecution and now reminding us, reminding the church back then of um, the, the teaching of Jesus, especially in relationship to him being the son of God. So every what we need to remember is that and, and the letters, too, like Philippians. It wasn't written to us. It was written to the Philippians. But it was written for us. So what do we need to do? We need to understand as best possible what were the Philippians like? What were they dealing with? What were their issues? And then we can, we can take the step to say, okay, if, that was, if those were their issues... And that's how Paul is addressing their issues. Then how are their issues parallel to my issues? And what does that say to me? So it's always the step of what was it saying to them? And then on that basis, what is it saying to me? And the passage that I'm going to deal with today is, is one that's so fun and so fascinating and so hard to understand it's considered to be the most difficult parable that Jesus ever told for us, for modern readers. And so let's, let's, let's read it together. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot manage any longer. You cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. And I know, I know, so I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. And there's a pause. I know what I'll do. So that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. And then there's a break. In our passage, uh, in the New International Version, there's no break there. It goes right on in the same paragraph. But I think there should be a break here because this is where the parable ends and then it goes into the explanation. Now, this is called the parable of the unfaithful manager or the parable of the unjust steward, 
A steward is someone who stewards the money of someone else. Um, and it is probably the most difficult to understand. At least three reasons why it's difficult to understand, why it confuses us. First, it seems that Jesus is telling us that a person who deliberately lied to save his own skin is actually an example for us. You know? This, this, this manager was a liar, and he lied to save his own skin. And how is he supposed to be an example? Secondly, we have no idea why in the story the manager's master lets him get away with it and even commends him at the end. Like, what's that about? The guy's lying, he's cheating his master, and in the end, the master says, oh, you were really shrewd. It's like, come on, no, fire the dude. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then thirdly, we also don't understand why the land renters would go along with it. You know, come on in. Okay, write down, you know, write down 800 instead of 1,000. Like, well, what's that about? Um, and, and were, were they complicit in, in treachery, or, or what, what were they doing here? Um, so in order to understand this parable, we have to try to look at the clues that are there, and we really have to understand the culture of the day, which is very different than our culture, but has some similarities. We have to ask, what was the relationship between the landowner and the tenant farmers? Uh, so these, these debtors, they were, one, they were tenant farmers. They were on the, on the land, farming the land. They didn't own it. And so they had agreed to um, certain um, conditions in terms of what they were going to pay the landowner. Um, what role did the steward, the manager, play? And what clues does the parable give us about the character of the landowner, of the steward, and of the tenants? Um, so first, what was the relationship between the landowner and, and the tenant farmers? In the Middle Eastern culture, it was usually a very cordial kind of relationship from what we read. It wasn't a... It wasn't the kind of thing where, where it's, it's like, oh, you know, the hated landowner and he's oppressing the, the peasant class. It was, it was more cordial. There were, there were, it was a known social, social relationship and sometimes even a friendship kind of relationship. Um, Karen and I know about that because God has given us the grace to be landlords. So we have rental property. We, we actually have... Two rental properties. And so I'm, I'm going to just lay all the cards out here. You're going to look at me and say, oh, man, you know. Anyway, I don't know what you're going to think. But, but, God, but, but God's given us two rental properties. We have the opportunity of, one, being gracious to the, to the people by not overcharging them. Um, two, actually building a relationship with them. And coming and being responsive to come over and help the minute anything's wrong, to keep the property really up and, and, and you know, up to snuff. And so we have, um, you know, when I come into the house where the land, where the, where the tenants are, the little kids come, oh, Mr. Steve, Mr. Steve, it's great to see you. You know, it's a... They're, I don't have grandkids, and so sometimes they're little kids. You know, they, they've even drawn pictures of me and to, for me to hang on my fridge and stuff, you know, and they're just always thrilled to have me there. That's more what the relationship was between a landowner and the tenant farmers in the Middle Eastern culture. It was an accepted, common kind of a, a, a relationship, sometimes friendship-wise, but always cordial. Um, if anything happened in terms of the ability of those tenants to pay, it would be known in the village. It's, it's you know, everything's open cards in a village kind of a setting. Um, the contract would be entered into either with a specific amount due, which is like in our case, or a percentage, a percentage of the crop. But it was always part of the crop that would be due from the tenant farmers. 
Um, if there are difficulties related to, the, uh, to crop failure or disease in the trees or drought, the tenants had the right to expect that the landowner would take this into account would say, oh yeah, okay, you were supposed to pay um, 1,000 gallons or 800 gallons of oil, or yeah, which one was it? Was it 800? Yeah, 800, yeah, 800, 800 gallons of, of oil. Um, no, 900 gallons of oil, make it 450. Yeah, that was, that was the expected amount no matter what. Um, or sometimes it was a percentage based on what would come from the land. Um, but if difficulties arose, it was expected that the landowner would take that into account. In, a, in other words, be gracious. What about the, the manager? What role did he play? Well, he related to the tenants at the behest of the owner. He negotiated contracts. He kept the books. He would handle exchange. And, and apparently this... Um, this would be a fairly wealthy landowner because he had a manager. He wasn't doing it himself. And even when, uh, when the manager called to the tenants, he summoned them. That means he sent a servant to go get them to come. He didn't go get them himself. So this means this is a big operation here. Um, it was not unusual for the manager to receive a bribe. Uh, to help negotiate a fair, favorable contract. But anything like that would be under the table and pretty much expected in that culture. A, a bribe here or there, even like it in Proverbs, it says, you know, a, bri a bribe properly placed greases the, you know, s eases the contract. Um, that, that was not uncommon, it, but it would be nothing in terms of huge amounts. These are sm small amounts, more like tips. And it was expected that the manager would kind of speak the best for, you know, for the tenant, like represent the tenant as well as representing the manager, um, be the, the in-between person. Um, it was also expected, yeah, so it was expected that the interests of the tenant would be represented to the, to the master through, through the manager. Now, what about the clues that the parable gives us regarding the main characters? Well, one of the clues right at the very beginning is that the landowner is merciful. He demands that the manager turn in the account books when he realizes and, and sees that he's been an untrustworthy manager. He says, turn in the account books. But what, he doesn't, what doesn't he do? He doesn't put him in jail. He could have, if he was a unfaithful mishandling of the funds, he could have been put in jail, but he's not. That's a clue. Um, he doesn't put him in jail, and he doesn't disgrace him publicly. He doesn't announce it. He just simply says, turn in the account books. So the master is, is merciful. The second thing is that the manager, he doesn't argue his case he realizes that he's failed, and his main concern is, what can I do now? i I got to have a job. What am I going to do? I've got to live. I, I'm too weak to beg. Or I'm too weak to dig. I don't want to beg. What can I do? And so he hits upon an idea based upon his experience that the manager is merciful. Kenneth Bailey, who writes about this, a really excellent author, he says, it's our understanding of the parable that the steward's plan is to risk everything on the quality of mercy he's already experienced from his master. If he fails, he will certainly go to jail. If he succeeds, he will be a hero in the community. So this is what happens. He figures out a plan where he's going to look good, but his master's going to look good as well. And his master's going to look so good that he's not going to He's not going to tell anybody about the fakery. So he, it's all dependent on the fact that no one knows yet that he's been fired. He, the, the master didn't make it public, so no one knows yet. So what, what does he do? He summons the tenants. And, and what's the scripture say? Qu come quickly. 
It's all, it's all rush, rush, hurry, hurry. Why is it rush, rush, hurry, hurry? Well, the word's going to get out that he's fired and his plan's not going to work and, and, unless the people think he's still representing the master. So he summons the tenants and he says, how much do you owe? Well, he knows how much they owe. This is just how negotiations in that, in that setting, it's just to establish the fact. He can look at the books. He knows exactly what they owe. But he, he asks them, how much do you owe? And um, 900 gallons of olive oil. The manager says, okay, take the bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. And then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. It's all going fast. And, and then what happens in the village right away? Well, everybody knows each other, and they're all involved in this. And, and, and so right away they start talking about the master. Oh, my goodness, did you hear that? The master, he knew how tough things were going for me. He knew this was going to be a difficult year. He just cut my bill in half. The master's looking really, really good. Now, because they think that the manager is acting at his behest. Um, and, and so it starts going around. Um, wow, isn't this the greatest, the greatest landowner uh, in history? He just cut my bill in half, or he just cut, cut my bill down 200 bushels. Um, and so the word is going out, and in the end, the owner calls the manager in, and he says, dude, <laughs> that was shrewd. <laughs> dude, you, you know, you got me looking good here. Okay, I'm, I'm going to just let it stand. I'm, I, I don't, he, he had every right to say, you know what, that, that manager, he didn't act in my behalf. He was, he was doing that totally on his own. The, the owner had every right to say that, but he, he didn't want to lose face. Now that everybody thinks he's the most generous master around, he doesn't want to lose face. And so he says, dude, okay, you got me, but you understood something about me. You understood that I'm merciful. Then Jesus and that concludes the parable saying the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own than the people people of the kingdom of light there's there's a there is an honoring of that shrewdness there's an honoring basically of his understanding that he cast everything he put all his bets down on that the master was going to be merciful and the master was then Jesus goes on. I tell you, use worldly wealth. And un the word for worldly wealth is unrighteous mammon. It's, it's, uh, he's actually using the Aramaic word for money, mammon, that Jesus would have used when he was preaching. Because uh, Jesus spoke mostly in Aramaic when he preached. And it was translated then into Greek in the, in the texts that we have and then into English from that. Um, but they take the word that Jesus actually used, mammon. It's just the, the Aramaic word for money. But something about the tone of how Jesus used that in talking about mammon, it's like it's personified. And so he, they don't translate it. They take it right from the Aramaic and say, take... Um, Use unrighteous mammon to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling unrighteous mammon, worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches, the riches of the kingdom? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you will 
be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. And he said to them, you're the ones who just justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. So what do we learn from that? Okay, it's, 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 it's uh, what are the practical applications for us? The first is that money is not neutral. Money is not neutral. That's point number one in your outline there. Jesus calls it unrighteous mammon. Um, I tell you, use unrighteous mammon to gain friends for yourselves. It's fascinating that the biblical writers use the word mammon right out of the Aramaic. Um, they, it's, it's, like I said, it, it's as if Jesus is personifying money. It's, it's more than a neutral substance that lies around inactive. Later in this section, he's going to tell us you cannot serve both God and mammon. He tells us that money wants to be served. I don't know about you, but I think most of us, we like to think of money as basically neutral. That you can use it either for good or for ill. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil, not money itself. And that's absolutely true. Money can be used both for good and for ill. And it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. But at the same time, when Jesus called money mammon, he was also letting us know it, that money also has a power. And I'll get to that in point four. But it also has a, it, money has a power. It, it wants to be served. I talked a couple of weeks ago about um, Bob Dylan um, and, and one of his songs. And uh, there's another one of his songs that uh, came out about the same time. You got to serve somebody. Um, some of you remember that, you know. You might be an ambassador from England or France. You might like to gamble. You might like to dance. You might be the heavyweight champion of the world. You might be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yeah, you are. You're going to have to serve somebody. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord. But you're going to have to serve somebody. That was a powerful song. Right, right to the heart. That... That's what he's getting at, that he's interpreting this passage from Jesus. You cannot serve both God and mammon. They both are vying for our loyalty. And money is not neutral. So there, there's a, we, we use it for God's purposes, we invest it, but there's a certain danger that's always there about it trying to grip us. Um, the second thing is that m the wisest money investment is always an investment in people. The wisest money investment is always an investment in people. Jesus says, Use worldly wealth and righteous mammon to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Some commentators say that this refers to the angels welcoming us into heavenly dwellings when, uh, when we go to be with the Lord. It could be. We don't, it, it's kind of a difficult, like, who is it who's welcoming us into heavenly dwellings? The friends that we make for ourselves, it's difficult for us to make friends with angels, right? Um, I don't think it's really talking about angels. It's not like I, I, I you know, I'm walking down the street and I kind of chatting it up with my angel uh, guard. Um, I don't think those are the ones that we're supposed to make friends with. But maybe it's like this. When we use worldly wealth to invest in people, 
then we're preparing a way for welcome into heavenly dwellings. And whether it's the angels that do it, or maybe it's actually the people who we helped <laughs> who are doing it, we're, we're welcomed in. I think ultimately it's God who welcomes in, us in. If we invest our money, if we use our money to make friends for ourselves, that sounds manipulative, right? <coughs> But um, there are different ways for us to make friends for ourselves. I, I, I had a missionary friend whose dad used to say this. He, says, he said, the second after you die, you're going to thank God for every dollar you ever, you ever gave to missions. <laughs> what he's saying is that those investments in missions are preparing a way for the heavenly welcome into heavenly dwellings. And... Yeah, you know, you're not going to remember the money that you laid up for yourself. The second after you die, it's all the money you gave away. That's what's going to matter. Um, I, I have personal experience with, with this whole thing of, of using worldly wealth to make friends for yourselves. Because um, Karen and I have a money manager. Now, we didn't plan it that way. It just, it just happened. My best friend growing up, the, my oldest friend, Greg Tupmark, we met in kindergarten. Um, he was a part of my Sunday school class in kindergarten, but also he was a part of my kindergarten class going to, um, go, going to uh, uh, you know, elementary school. And so um, we've known each other that long. And he was a realtor, and so he helped us buy our first house. And then eight years later, when we were going into the mission field, he said, hey, listen, let me go ahead and manage it for you. And I'll, I'll just manage it for free, and I'll, I'll be your property manager. And so he came alongside of us and was our property manager. And so we were in Germany then for eight years, and then we came back home from Germany. And, and the property... We were getting home in June, and the property was uh, coming available. Uh, the, the renters were moving out in January, and he said, what, what do you want me to do? I said, well, Greg, you know, we can't handle six months of no income in the house, so just go ahead and rent it, and then we'll figure something out. So he went ahead and rented it, and then he said, well, have you guys thought about buying? And I was like, well, no. He says, well, you know, conditions are right. You, you should really think about it. Let, let me help you. And so we had had some money that Karen had put aside from the sale of her business. And uh, so there was money there for down payment, but not enough. And then, and, um, um, you know, he, he came alongside and, and, and helped us out through, through his mom and allowed us we we bought without even seeing it sight unseen we bought a house over the you know over the internet he went through the house with his wife Brenda and walked through and was calling talking to us in Germany and we ended up buying a house without even seeing it um <clears throat> and came home and moved into a house that he had arranged for us through using money to make friends for yourselves and uh and so then, you know, then we, had, then we had two houses. Well, then he managed those two. And then he charged us for the second house and not for the first house. But, uh, but, and then there were times where it, things didn't exactly balance out. And so he would, well, okay, I'll borrow a little bit from my mom, and then we'll make this work. And it'll all come together. And he just kind of, we didn't have to think about it. He just smoothed it out for us. That's a classic example of using worldly wealth to make friends for yourselves. He, in the way that he was generous to us, um, you know, it, it just cemented a lifelong friendship. And, and then it just has continued along that line. Now, now, he's, um, now he's dealing with actually onset of early, early, uh, early onset Alzheimer's. And, uh, you know, it's 
you can bet that that's a friendship that's very precious to us, and we're going to be walking, you know, walking with them through the next stages. But I, I love that the way we deal with money and handle money can make a huge impact in the lives of other people around us. And the best investments that we can ever make are always investments in people. Um, the third thing is that how you handle money is indicative of your faithfulness. How you handle money is an, is an indicator of your faithfulness. So Jesus says, so if you've been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? I think the fact that Karen and I were faithful in giving all of our married life, giving the tithe and beyond, was part of the reason that God entrusted us with being missionaries in Germany for 18 years. And when we were going around and raising support and coming to churches like yours and asking for uh, monthly support, God knew we had been faithful in our handling of money, and so we could rightfully ask for that kind of support. I think that's the way it works in the kingdom of God. We're trustworthy with the small things, Jesus says. Well, the small things are, are not that small, the handling of money. But he says that's a small thing in comparison to kingdom leadership and kingdom responsibility. But we won't be given kingdom responsibility if we're not faithful in the small things. Um, speaking of snowboarding, one of the things that happened back just before Karen and I started itinerating to go on the mission field is that I, I received unexpectedly a gift of, um, I think it was like $560. Um, and that, that was a big deal. And I had just learned to snowboard just a couple of months before and had fallen in love with it. I'd only been up two times, but was just like blown away with how cool that sport was. And so I thought, wow, God, that's amazing. 560 bucks, that's just, just enough to buy snowboard and snowboard boots. That's like perfect, you know. And then, and then uh, you know, as I was praying and thinking about stuff, I felt like really impressed that God said there was an opportunity to invest in a certain missions project that was a really a big deal at our church. And, and I, I, I felt like God said, Steve, I want you to, you know, take that money and give it uh, to the missions project. And I, I was like, oh, man, a snowboard really would have been a nice thing, you know. And, uh, but, I, but, I, but I did. I invested. I, I, I gave that, that money away, invested it in the missions project. And, and, and I just think that what that did was it laid a pattern of God entrusting us with spiritual riches that, that were like waves going down. You know, now when I communicate with friends in Germany and they talk about the way we influenced their lives and shaped their whole future and and uh, their whole understanding of the kingdom of God and, and what, what spiritual life looks like. Part of the beginning of that ripple was just saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to give that, I'm going to give that money instead of buying a snowboard. And two years later, or three years later, I think it was, Karen surprised me uh, by buying, you know, buying me a snowboard. And it was like way, way better than if I'd ever bought one myself. It was, it was just like an amazing thing. So it, when we give money, when, the way we handle our money is an indicator of our faithfulness. The fourth thing is that money is a power, a competing God that battles for your allegiance. Money is a power, a competing God that battles for your allegiance. 
No one can serve two masters. You got to serve somebody. The fifth thing is that if you miss that truth, you're, you risk missing out on God altogether. So the Pharisees who loved money sneered at Jesus. They didn't get the spiritual truth about money. And because they didn't get the spiritual truth about money, they didn't get what? They didn't get Jesus. They sneered at Jesus about this. And it's, it's, so it's one of these things. If you miss this truth, you risk missing, missing out on God altogether. So, what about practical implications then for everyday life? Okay, I'm going to just whip through these really fast. Number one, determine to give the tithe as your essential first step. That's, that's, that's kind of the, that, that, that's the bottom line. That's the starting point. Um, the scripture says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. The tithe is the basic kind of step of discipleship in terms of, okay, if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, if I'm committing my life fully to God, then the starting point is to give the tithe. The, the 10% of my income, that goes to God's work. No questions asked. The second thing is to set up a system for regular giving. I, for, for Karen and me, for years now, we've, we've just done automatic deduct. So, you know, my salary was pretty much set, and so just it would just come out, uh, out of the checkbook, automatically deduct, and, and go to the church, and that was that was how we did it. It it made it easy. I didn't have to think about it. Now what I what that did do was sometimes in automating the process, I kind of lose th that sense of you know sacrifice of giving of like that physical act of writing a check or putting money. And so that third point is an important one for me: give whenever you have opportunity to do so. I've just tried to live by the principle, any time the offering pay, plate is passed, I'm going to try to put something in it. Sometimes I don't have cash in my wallet. Sometimes, you know, a lot of times what happens is the only cash in my wallet I have is 20s because I got them from the cash machine, and they come out as 20s, and then I'm like, oh, crap. Um, all I've got is a 20, you know. <laughs> and I really didn't want to necessarily give that much as a token but you know what what that does it's like it's like i'm saying to money you don't you don't have power over me see i'm going to take that i'm going to give that money in the offering as a demonstration i have one lord it's it's the the lord jesus and I can't serve God in money, so I'm going to serve God. So give whenever you have the opportunity. Fourthly, give where you have the confidence that it will be well used. Give where you have confidence that it will be well used. That, that's, you know, there are, there are countless people and agencies and institutions and trusts and, and uh, people on the street. They're all asking for money. Um, we we have a responsibility as a giver to figure out, okay, is this going to be used responsibly or not? And I'll tell you one thing you don't want to do is listen to all the TV ads about helping starving animals, you know, because if you look behind what's going on in that, there's pennies on the dollar that are actually going to helping starving animals, and these are scams just collecting in huge amounts of money. And it's um, now there might be some legit ones, I'm sure, but for th for the most part, they're pretty illegitimate. Or or like the fire, you know, the the fire brigade people who call you on the phone and say, you know, we're we're collecting money for, you know, for for the firemen. And then you you look it up, and actually there's pennies on the dollar that are going to actual needs of firemen, and these are just institutions that are making money off of our goodwill. So, so what you, we want to be careful. We want to be wise 
in how we give. So we, we, we respond. Jesus said, give to those who ask of you. There's this tension because, you know, we get asked all the time. So I, I think that that call to be wise is really, really crucial. Um, and the fifth thing is remember that Satan fights vigorously over this territory. Fights vigorously. Don't fall prey to fear. Jesus said, he's talking about how God closed the grass of the fields, and he says, if that's how God closed the grass, grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Don't fall prey to fear. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We... The worry is going to rob us of our joy in the day and is not going to do a thing to help the trouble tomorrow. <laughs> and, and, and so Satan, Satan loves to, to put fear in our hearts about money. And, and I realize, I mean, I was a pastor of a congregation that had a lot of people struggling with money. A lot of people who didn't know where the next, you know, where the next paycheck was going to come from. People who were struggling with uh, divorce settlements where they were having to pay so much money out of their, out of their um, bank account every, every month that they didn't know how they were going to be able to handle. Um, you know, there's, there's just all kinds of situations like that. These are real things. But God, God wants us to give our fears to him. Cast your burdens upon him, for he cares for you. He's, he's got this. Don't fall prey to fear. And don't, don't let your fear prevent you from doing the basic steps of taking that having enough faith to say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you with the tithe. I'm going to trust you that if I give that 10%, that you're going to overflow. You're going to overflow the, the vats. Jesus, we, um, every one of us is dealing with money as a real thing. Um, some of us are you know, you've, you've just taken care of us so well and we really don't have any worries or concerns. And um, others of us, Lord, are... Um, this, this is, even as we sit here, we're thinking, man, I, it's, it's looking tough for us right now. We hear testimonies all the time about how you provide. Lord, let us trust you. Let us trust you as the provider. Let us also trust you as the one who is so merciful and so, um, yeah, so generous in the way that you handle money that, that we can throw all our chips on on you know, on, on that square, um, that we can, we can bet it all on, on you. Just like that dishonest steward said, I'm going to trust that the master is merciful and it worked out for him. How much more, how much more can we put our confidence and trust in you? Let's just um, let's just contemplate his goodness, his trustworthiness.
and that we can we can tr- um, we can put all pu- put all our chips on him we can yeah I'm not a gambler so I don't even know the t- <laughs> I don't even know the t- terminology but I think you know what I mean we're all in we're all in for that God has got this that God's got us let's just uh, Ben's going to lead us in, in a song together as we reflect and just think about how God's got it
It's as simple as it gets To worship you It's the reason I exist It's the reason I exist And it all comes down to this You're the highest and the greatest name I was thinking about the fact that what do we call it when we pass the plate? An offering. Offerings have always been a part of worship. Um, it's always, there's the giving of something, giving up of something. That's a part of what it means to, to worship God. And so part of his discipleship process in us is, is just helping us understand that more and more and to know, okay, what, Lord, what's the offering now? What's the offering this time that you want from me? And it's not a matter of how much. It's just a matter of listening to him. Um, so, Lord, we, we offer ourselves to you which includes all of us. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. And Lord, let us tr trust you with this. Let us trust you with this. That you won't open up the windows of heaven and provide for us it with abundance. And we're looking forward, Lord, to being welcomed into heavenly dwellings. That's going to be just an amazing moment. Be welcomed in. And we say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, why don't you give a hug to some of your fellow givers? And um, God be with you. I look forward to seeing you in, uh, in three, three weeks um, for another wonderful Sunday together.